Before we get started, I want to say that your book, Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, came out a few years ago. It's absolutely fantastic. You've got loads of brilliant stories in there, really in-depth, some brilliant pictures and things like that in there. So we're going to touch on certain little bits from that, but I recommend everybody to check out that book, Sex, Drums and Rock and Roll, because it is brilliant. And I want to say as well that the foreword was written by the legend that was Neil Peart. I mean, if there's anyone going to write a foreword for a drummer, then he's got to be up there at the top of the list, hasn't he? How did all that come about? Well, Neil and I had worked together when he was producing the Buddy Rich big band, uh, Burning for City, Burning, Bur Burning, Burning for Buddy Rich, and uh, and it was a two CD thing, uh, two CDs on Atlantic Records, and I was in the early '90s, and he, um, I was called by uh, Kathy Rich, Buddy's daughter, to be part of that recording, and Neil was producing, so I met him on that, and then we, I mean, it was very, very 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 nice very sweet very focused knew what he wanted to do and all and i was working up in, and that was done in new york but later that year i was recording up at Morin heights which was a studio where rush had recorded and all kinds of bands about a maybe an hour outside of montreal and i was recording with corey hart and all of a sudden i see neil's head pop through the door very humble humbly going trying to get my attention i went Neil, what are you doing here? Had no idea that they had worked there a lot or didn't. I didn't think about it at the time. And then he asked me if I could play percussion with him on like eight or 16 measures of a pick up the pieces that Steve Ferroni had played drums on. Steve didn't want to do a drum solo. And Neil thought it'd be cool if we did a whole percussion thing together. And we did. And I done a lot of percussion and orchestrating that sort of thing on Mellencamp records so I kind of knew you start from you can start from low frequencies you start working your way up through percussion till you get the high frequencies and I was sharing those ideas with Neil and we had an incredible time we sh we talked about me being the ball bandito brothers and then I went to his house and uh, either that day, I think later that day, and and we listened to the whole record and drank some scotch, and we became very yeah. good friends. And uh, and then when it was time for me to get somebody to, to um, do the forward of the book, I wanted somebody that understood me. Now he and I both were into jazz, both ended up as rock play drummers, you know, career wise, and both of us are very into sports. And um, I thought this guy will understand me on those levels and he asked me to send him three chapters and he said this is great so he wrote the forward and it was pretty close to when he was diagnosed with cancer you know yeah so i felt honored you know Absolutely. Absolutely fantastic. Well, it's, it's, like I said, everyone check out the book. It is fantastic to read and you'll hear more stories in there than, than we can get through on a, a little interview like this. But uh, definitely check out Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll. So you mentioned Mellencamp quickly there. We have to start there, really, don't we? I mean, a long and fruitful career uh, in association with John and some fantastic hits, some great records, that sort of thing. But first off, what was it like working with John in the studio, creating songs and, and putting records together? There was a lot of pressure on us because he had a lot of pressure on him. He'd already lost his record deal. And the, and, the, and the first record that came out where he had a record deal, they changed his name from John Mellencamp, which is his family name or given name, to Johnny Cougar, and he was not happy with that. And when the record came out, it didn't do well. He lost his deal in one year. So he, when he finally got another deal, he was adamant about being successful. And we would rehearse from... Uh, 11 in the morning till 5 at night uh, and then take a dinner break for two hours and work from 7 to 11 five days a week wow. like a business and uh, his whole thing one day he walked in the studio after we'd had a big success with American Fool a number one and number two hit single in the top 100 on the billboard charts which is those are the charts when you're number one on those charts you're number one it's, yep. there's a lot of a lot of charts and people say I've had 20 number one hits <laughs> But the charts don't mean anything. This was the this is where you're competing with the Rolling Stones, Elton John, the Please, Tom Petty, you know, whoever is the greatest. And you 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 you're competing with the industry on all formats. Yeah. So if you're number one on that top 100, you are literally number one in the country, if not the world. So um, after that record, John came in one day and went, "Listen, you guys, 
I need ideas. I need ideas. I need hits. I need pe people to come up with innovative and creative ideas to make my songs become hits on the radio. Because the North Star, and I figured this out when I got after I got fired after being in the band for five weeks from making that record, Nothing Matters and What If It Did, suddenly I realized, oh my God, this is not about me at all. This is about me getting a song on the radio. What is my contribution to that song, to that artist? What can I do as a drummer and a person to get that song on the radio to be number one? That's Super Bowl mentality. Yeah. You're not thinking about you, you're thinking about the team the song, the artist, it's not about me. That was a huge revelation for me. And uh, that is what made me who I became. So yeah, he was right. I need ideas to get these songs on the radio to have hits. And he said, Kenny, if somebody has a better drum beat than what you're playing, you play it. And everybody in this band, you don't own your instruments. We all play each other's instruments. Whatever it takes to get a number one hit. And he walked out of the room and I thought, what a jerk. But he was right. Um, emotionally, I was like, you know, you know, wait a minute, it's about me. He was right. He says, what do we as a group need to do to get on the radio and beat out Tom Petty and Billy Joel and Sting and the police and Springsteen and Elton John? I mean, there's only 10 slots in the top 10. So to be number one? You're telling everybody, wow, you just blew everybody out. So he he was right in that regard. That was so there was a lot of pressure all the time. All the time, whether it was uh in the studio or on stage, to be great. And we went from playing in front of, you know, a thousand people to selling out arenas all around yeah. America, double nights, two nights in a row, Madison Square Garden, two nights, no opening act, just us. 360 degrees flying around in private jets but this didn't come from from this came from hard work self-discipline perseverance and never taking your foot off the gas you just we went eight years non-stop you know rehearse for you know, john would write the songs and we'd have to come up with parts to make those songs great as a team i mean it always went to me first like what do you got aronoff after listening to a song <laughs> once and I'd be like, and all, and he admitted they all sounded the same. Acoustic guitar, you know, and I'd have to come up with, a, I came up with a method, how to come up with creative ideas. But it was a lot of pressure. And then, you know, we, we would do, he would write songs, we'd arrange the songs, go in the studio, rehearse them, throw songs out, regroup, do it again. That would take a year. Mix, master. Then we'd yeah. do promotion, make videos, do uh, interviews and stuff for about a month or so, then rehearse for tour, then go on tour. That's two years. Take a month off and start again. We did that for four consecutive records, and we ended up playing in, in arenas. And we were set up to possibly go into stadiums, but John quit the music business for about three years. He said, I've had enough. He was fried. Yeah. And um, I was. that was a real pivotal point for me because when he quit, and it was at the last show of the Lonesome Jubilee Tour. We just sold out a Summerfest. He says, he throws a bonus check at me back when they gave bonuses out. And he said, mm. uh, man, I'm quitting the music business for three years. Mm. Don't spend it in one place. I went, what? So I was freaking out. Yeah. I'd just gotten divorced. And I had, you know, expenses. And I went, wow, if that guy doesn't work, I don't work. I said, that'll never happen again. So I decided... All right. The next day I woke up and went, all right, he's not working, but I'm going to work with all the other people that are out there that are big. And I started going to Nash, uh, no, L.A. and started doing sessions. And eventually I got in to the scene where I had drums in New York, Nashville, L.A., Indiana, where I lived, Japan and Germany. And eventually people would fly me all over the world to make records and I ended up playing on the last I counted was 300 million records sold. You know, that's, you know, I got some gold <laughs> records here that yeah. meatloaf up there that sold 400 million records. And Jeez. then there's a Celine Dion record right there that sold basically 400 million records. Labels making 85 cents in a dollar. You do the math. That's yeah. a lot of money. They can reinvest in new artists. Well, that whole thing just completely went away. 
That's why I moved everything to L.A. And I, you're in my studio, Uncommon Studios L.A., because I have a thing called adapt or die. In any business, doesn't matter if you're on a basketball court or, you know, playing sports or on a rock and roll stage or you're in a corporate boardroom meeting, you know, you have to come up with creative and innovative ideas yep. to solve, come up with solutions to problems, as I did for Jack and Diane, that makes the company millions of dollars. And if you don't, you're going to lose your place. You're going to be not relevant and you will, that's why I say adapt. Or die. Or die. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just jumping back, you mentioned Jack and Diane there. We have to touch on that. I mean, an incredible song. It's not a, not a normal song in any way. It starts, it stops. It's got different instrumentation. The claps are in there. It's it's a very strange, structured song. And and you've got the drum machine on there as well. So so take us through the, the process of, of putting that one together. And and to, to, get, to begin with, how was your feelings about working with the drum machine? Was it your choice or was it kind of something you were told that was going to happen? It wasn't my choice. Uh, I walk into the room, it was the most difficult record I've ever made in my life, and that mm -hmm. record won two Grammys and sold millions. <laughs> we spent nine weeks at Criteria Studios in, in um, you know Miami and basically walked out with not, uh, four songs. Two guys got fired. I almost got in a fist fight with John because he was being a complete idiot to me. And, um, and he, uh, I walk in one day and the co-producers got a... A, a metal box and I went hey Don what's that and he goes oh this is uh the Bee Gees are using it next door it's the newest thing it's called the Lin One drum machine I went drum machine oh my <laughs> god that replaces drummers and so that was a moment where I got into I didn't realize it, it was like survival it's not fight or flight for me it was fight or fight I grabbed the machine and this is an adapt or die situation yeah. perfect Perfectly adapt or die. I grab the machine, grab the manual, and I go, I'm going to be a part of this new technology. Yeah, own it. Yeah. If I'd gone and sulked and been like, God, woe is me, I wouldn't have programmed that thing. Somebody else would have programmed. So I just want to be part of it. So I get the manual and I basically program what I was playing on the drum set. But you have to remember, this is a new technology, a new sound. So, and in the air tonight with Phil Collins had already been on was already on the radio and that was exactly drum machine and drums so i program this i give it back to them it's got eight outputs the lin one had eight outputs they could bring every fader up on the board and they were mixing stuff and i'm thinking in the lounge i'm like god what's going on am i being are the drummers being replaced by machines mm -hmm. is that what's happening am i in the horse and buggy business and the car showed up <laughs> you know it's like and you're like hey guess what bye bye you know and two hours later i get summoned into the control room and john goes hey dude we need a drum solo or a drum break right here after the second chorus and i'm crapping in my pants but i'd learned my lesson two years prior where i'd gotten fired i went i kept going save the song save your career serve the song serve the artist serve the band serve the producer serve everybody what can i do to get this song on the record on the record because this song was not on the record no oh. cool song very unique it's just a kind of acoustic song great words lyrics but we had to come up with a way to arrange it and present it that had relevance so um I think I we spent all day getting drum sounds because back then they put drums in vocal booths. They could control the sound better. Now John wants the biggest sound in the world. We put it in a big room, but nobody knew where to put the mics. Obviously, the close mics, the overheads. But where do you put the room mics? And then what kind of chain of EQ and compression and effects do you do? And it took all day to figure this out. Wow. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, be be come up with a, a, a drum part that's going to save this song. So now it's my moment. I'm crapping in my pants. The machine's going, goose, goose, goose. Bam, boosh, doosh, doo. Bam, boosh, doosh, doo. Kablam! Kick drum on the and of three, flam on the snare drum on four, and I stopped. And I looked in the control room to get some validation. And I had nine guys going like this. So that's 18 thumbs. <laughs> so... You know, my first thought was I still got my job. That's what I thought. 
So then I thought, well, everybody goes down the drums. I'm going to go up the drums. So I was mimicking what the bass drum was doing, which is one, two, three, four, uh, 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 four, one, uh, uh, four. And I hit a dead end. Those all, nope. John asked me to come in. Cortisol levels go up, adrenaline goes up. I'm scared. I'm going to be fired again. And I got half the people telling me what to do and half the people telling me not what to do. Suddenly light off, a light went off in my head. I went, it's up to you, buddy. It's all on you to save your career. I walked out to the big room. I looked at the drums. I went, this is like the World Series. And you're up to bat. You hit a home run, you're the hero. You strike out, you're the loser. That's the way I looked at it. So I'm 40 feet away from my drum. I'm going, what are you going to play, Kenny? I'm 30 feet. I like, I don't know. I'm like 20 feet, dude. This is your career. 10 feet. I don't know what I'm going to play. I get to the drums. I put my headphones on. I'm looking at them. Look at the drums. And all of a sudden, thank God, a light went off in my head. I went, look, I have no idea what to do different. So why don't you use what you've already been doing? And in a nutshell... I took that beat that I was playing, I went up the tom-toms, but instead of starting on one, I moved the whole thing over one-eighth note. I don't know why I came up with that. Maybe it was from all the drum books I was working out of. But I went one, two, three, four, one, uh, uh, uh. And by the time I got there, John's hitting talk back, hit a cymbal. One, two, three, a uh, one, two, three, boom, blam. Uh, 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 hit the symbol. Now I'm at the top of the room. I just said, I'm going to take what Phil Collins used. <laughs> Ran out of drums. So I put it, made a triplet. Bop, boom, boom, boom. Touchdown. Everybody loved it. Mick Ronson from David Bowie's band was in there watching us record. He's a friend of John's. He suggested that Kenny keep playing a beat and let everybody sing some sort of a cappella thing. So let it rock, so let it roll, let the Bible Belt come save my soul. So let it rock, so let it, it was this big anthem thing. So I didn't even hear that. John just said, come on, keep playing a beat. So I started by playing 16th notes on the hi-hat and going, do. To God, do, God, do, to God. He goes, too much hi-hat. That was his way of talking, scream at you. Too much hi-hat. So I went, all right, mofo. And I didn't play any hi-hat. So play some hi-hat. So <laughs> I had been listening to Steve Gadd playing on a Chick Corea album mm -hmm. and a song called Lenora. And he was doing this thing where he go, do, to God, to do. The boom, do got to do to boom, and he hit the floor tom on beat four. That's why I came up. Steve Gadd playing with a jazz artist influenced me to come up with boom, but that doom, boom, floor tom and snare drum. So when I played the hi hat on three e and uh, it opened up boom, but that boom, scum, boom, but that boom, scum, boom, but that doom, scum, boom, touchdown. I didn't even hear. The end result till the song was done, mastered, and recorded. It was this mammoth thing. So I'm just grateful the song got on the record. Mm -hmm. Now, back then, they released the first single. Back then, what they do is they play all the songs on top 100 radio, and people call up to say, hey, I like that song. And people can call up and voice their opinion, and they start rating. People wanted Hurt So Good. They release Hurts So Good. Hurts goes flying up the charts, hits number two. For six weeks, we couldn't beat out either the Tiger. But, you know, Rocky Rocky One was out. So yeah. the movie is selling the record. The record's selling the movie. So there's no way we're going to beat out either the Tiger. So they, st they start seeing that Jack and Diane is testing so high. Everybody likes that song. They'll play it specifically in certain markets, maybe New York, Seattle, Boston, whatever. Tested so high, they release it as a second single as Jack and Diane goes down to three and four. Release Jack and Diane. Now, we're like, really? That's your next single? Jack and Diane goes flying all the way, hits number one. Hurts so good, goes back up, 
Now we got two songs in the top 10. We're all over MTV. Next thing you know, we're on Saturday Night Live. You know, all the TV shows, Solid Gold, uh, you know, uh, Dick Clark, you name it. We're on it. SCTV up in Canada. John's career completely blows up. My career is launched. Who, who's that drummer? And the room I was in at Chateau Marmont Hotel on Sunset when I got fired two years ago, I was in that same room when that song went to number one. Wow. And here's, here's what I did. I celebrated for two seconds, and then I went, holy shit, I'm not number one. I got to do it again. How am I going to do it again? He hasn't written a song yet. I got to wait for John to write a song, and then I got to come up with a great drum part to prove that I'm a great drummer. That was what was in my mind. It's like a running back in football. They get a touchdown, they're immediately like, I need to do this again to show people that I'm really good. It's not like a one-off deal. So I never, I never bought that number one thing. I was grateful, uh, but I was like, I got to do it again. What's next? What do I do? I need to practice. How can I get better? You know, I have a saying, it goes like this. I'll never be as great as I want to be, but I'm willing to spend my entire life trying to be as great as I can be. I mean, that's just good. Like, it's like a running back in football. They don't score touchdowns every time they get the ball. Sometimes they do. Sometimes five yards, sometimes zero. Sometimes minus two, sometimes fumble. Sometimes they break their leg in preseason and they're out. But they come back because they love football i'm a running back in the music business i just keep going in the end zone in the end zone give me the game work right again. yeah right again. work hard go 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 yeah. and incredible. that's how you build it. that's how you build a career incredible stuff it sounds sounds like you you're so driven as well and it's such a, an environment for that because by the sounds of it john was a bit of a taskmaster as well and you're working and you're pushing yourselves and you between you and the group and john and and everyone is really trying to bring out the best in everybody and that's it just sounds like almost the best way to start a career because from that point on you can only go and and keep developing and pushing yourself well absolutely i mean the thing is is that you either get it or you don't yes you know, uh, some people would have gone like, I'm out of here. And two guys did quit in the making of American Fool after I'd been in two years. They went, this is it's not worth it. Not me. It, I'm not saying it was enjoyable. I mean, it was enjoyable times, but it was tough. But I recognize this is incredible. Mm -hmm. I'll be playing with John real soon uh, for a big event at the Indianapolis Stadium, the Colts Stadium, Indianapolis. I go up to him and hug him and say, I mean, I've done, I did the Kennedy Center Honors with him, and I've done Music Cares. I'm always grateful. Man, I learned so much by being around him and watching how he handled things. Yeah. Learned so much. It's, I, I won't even list it. It was just incredible. Totally invaluable. At the time, I didn't realize everything I was learning, but I see it now. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And also going through that type of experience, fighting to become great and being part of having a leader that didn't drink, didn't do drugs, totally clear minded, you know, and just driven everything from what you wear, the way we look on stage, the way we move, being very aware of the brand before we even knew what that word meant. And uh, being around that was, like you said, was an incredible foundation to deal with all kinds of things from that point on the easiest things and the hardest things. Yeah. Because you don't want to be the person that depends on people to to motivate you and to validate you. You need you want to validate yourself. You need to be honest with yourself, totally clear who you are. And I don't believe in the words mistakes or failures. I will refuse to use those words anymore because they trigger all kinds of emotions when you were a little kid where your dad said you effed up, or your teacher said you're a loser, or your friends say you're a loser, your teacher said you got an F, that you, you need to work harder. Kenny, you, you, you're not doing a great job right in front of the class. It triggers all those emotions that you will never get rid of, but you learn to replace them with the new thought process, which is like, when I do something that I didn't like, or I didn't wish I hadn't done, whether it's live or in the studio or wherever, you just say, focus focus, learn from this, adjust, adapt, 
and make it better. And every quote unquote thing that doesn't work out for you is a gift to help you get better. You think Tom Brady or, you know, uh, you know, Mahomes from, you know, Kansas City freak out when something goes wrong. They get disappointed for a second and they go, all right, what can I learn from that? I have three minutes to win the Super Bowl to get in the end zone. And Mahomes proved that last year in the Super Bowl yes. <laughs> with a busted up leg and playing against this, her intense defense. Yeah. He figured it out with his coach. So you, these are, these are gifts that help you become the best that you can be. And that's my goal is just to be the best I can be and get the most value out of this short little life I got. Absolutely. And then you mentioned, obviously, following on from from John deciding to take a break from the music business, that you, you decided you were going to put your efforts into, into serving loads of different people and becoming um, the best session drummer out there. And you wouldn't commit to just one person again. It would be all the different people. And it was Don Was, wasn't it, that really helped you get your way into that kind of way of working? Yes. Uh, I was working with Don Was. He called me up and asked me if I could do a Bob Dylan record. And then Bob... <laughs> was on tour so i'm like freaking out are you kidding me and but then bob couldn't do it because he was on tour for a while then he says well how about iggy pop i'm like are you kidding me yeah and i'm recording an iggy pop record and don who was he had he went to the grammys uh, you know i i was like so focused on just drums iggy pop and all of a sudden i walk in one day and says where's don he says, oh he had to go to the grammys we well we recorded a little bit and then he went to the grammys and he wins two grammys <laughs> one for nick of time with uh bonnie Raitt, bonnie Raitt which, yeah. he, which was her comeback record and then he won uh love shack for the b-52s he produced that and all of a sudden don's got two grammys there's our guy barefoot glasses and uh he comes back and next thing you know he said hey you want to record a bob Seger record yeah Hey, you want to record uh, Elton John four songs? Yeah. And it went on and on and on. And all of a sudden, Don blew up, and I was right there with him. The High Women, which is Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, and Waylon Jennings. Movie soundtracks. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And B.B. Um, King and Bonnie Raitt uh, at the same time doing a song for Air America. I mean, it was unbelievable. And, you know, so... Um, all of a sudden, my cred went up outside of John Mellencamp, and I suddenly realized I had two careers. Yeah. And there's where the conflict came in, because I was on a very small retainer. I took myself off retainer with the idea that if he calls, I'm not on retainer anymore. And uh, he did call. I was doing a Little Feet record. Uh, the Little Feet band, uh, Richie Haywood, the, the incredible drummer who was playing with Eric Clapton, they got me to play with them, and we were backing up like the Madonna of um, Sweden. She was a, a, a megastar stadium. So we did that record and I get a call, that, you know, from his, John's uh, right hand man said that John needs you this Thursday. I said, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm working two weeks with Little Feet. He says, well, John says, well, look, I, you know, you can do that stuff, but when I need you, I need you. I totally get it. But I said, John, they moved their entire schedule to accommodate me. And they built this whole session around me. I can't leave. Yeah. And so we just, I get it. I mean, John wanted a drummer that was accessible 24-7. And I was becoming that guy that was not accessible 24-7. And eventually, you know, we just parted ways. Yeah, indeed. And you mentioned some of the incredible names that you worked with. And I think uh, I, I either saw the interview or I read the interview. You were working with the Highwaymen and you were, was it Meatloaf at, pretty much at the same time? And it just shows the, the diversity of, of music that you were playing. All out rock with Meatloaf and the, the over the top stuff. And then you've got the Highwaymen there as well at the same time. It's just incredible. Well, I had the Buddy Rich Big Band. <laughs> I, I, flew, I took the red eye to fly to New York to perform with the Buddy Rich Big Band on the weekend and then fly <laughs> back and continue Meatloaf and the Highwaymen. But the greatest one was when I recorded with the Buddy Rich Big Band, Burning for Buddy CDs, I had spent one week in Philadelphia recording with Cinderella. Oh, wow. Then I went to Nashville and recorded one week with Hank Jr. <laughs> then I flew to New Orleans and recorded some... New or I don't even know who it was, New Orleans type of thing. Then I went to Canada, spent a week recording a country record with a, a girl, Patricia Conway, I believe. And then 
I flew to New York and recorded with the Buddy Rich Big Band. I mean, yeah, it's uh, you know, let me explain that you know it's, you 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 you've scored a touchdown when you practice your butt off and you get in a band and selling out arenas and you're all over the radio and MTV and you're on tour and you're in your private jet. You score a touchdown if you become a big session drummer in any one of the big markets, which was back then New York, Nashville, L.A. But I was doing both. And there was a few of us doing the same thing. Steve Lukather, for example, yeah. he was doing the same thing. Both session guy, Toto, you know, solo record, solo career. But, you know, then it gets deeper because then when you start being the person, they, they want you around because you motivate the room. You 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 save sessions, your 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 contribution as a person, mm -hmm. your personality, yeah. you know how to connect with people, you know how to communicate with people, you know how to collaborate. That now becomes a whole nother thing. Now you're really becoming a, a fine, there's a, a handful of people who do all of that. So, I mean, I, I, I didn't have this master plan, but as I look back, I think my intuition was exactly what I did. And now I realize why that worked and how that happened. Sounds, sounds incredible. I mean, I, I remember uh, Leland's, Glass saying that um, sometimes he kind of wished that he was part of a band and he was like almost like Flea where he had one band and he traveled and he only had to learn those songs rather than everybody else's songs and that sort of thing. I mean, uh, he's had an incredible career, same as you, but do, do you sometimes wish that you were part of a band in that way that you didn't have to float between everything or did would you not have got the kind of buzz that you got from doing what you did with so many different people and so many different genres and styles and, and places like that? Oh, I definitely think I, I like playing with everybody. You know, even when I was in the Mellencamp band, as big as we were, when I started recording with like Brian Setzer or Belinda Carlisle, uh, you know, we, we did Heaven on Earth, her first number one hit single yeah. outside of the Go-Go's. I mean, that was such a rush. Or Bob Seger or, you know, going on tour with, you know, the Smashing Pumpkins, uh, recording with John Fogarty, you know, I mean. Oh, man, or Joe Cocker. I mean, this is like incredible. So, yeah, I want both. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted both, you know. I mean, I interviewed Lee on my, you know, podcast, the Kenny Aronoff Sessions and Lukather, and my intros were like these long discographies. I wanted people to hear who these people play with. You know, I was doing Lee Star, and I'm naming name after name after name after yeah. name after name. And I get to James Taylor, I got 14 albums. I said, I said to the, the people viewing, I said, you have to understand when this, somebody asks you, to play on 14 records, it's not just how good a player you are. Yes. It's that they want you there because of who you are, your personality. It's not just about how good you play. There's all this other stuff. So um, I like playing with lots and lots of different people because it's stimulating. It makes me feel good mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know if we would have been happy with just one band. Sure, I'd love to have been in Led Zeppelin, yeah. But I think <laughs> I still would have always wanted to do other things yeah it's just the way i'm wired yeah yeah absolutely it's worked for you you've thrown out even more names there let's touch on a couple of them i mean john fogarty absolute legend as you said uh playing with someone like that who's got such a rich history um before you join him and everyone knows how he sounds and how credence sounded and things like that so so what was it like when you joined john and and you were backing up him what what advice or what instruction did he give to you well, the thing about John, I mean, he was my hero. I was just a no, I was a kid, a teenager, you know, uh, you know, listening to Credence. Yeah. You know, almost went to Woodstock. I only grew up three and a half hours away and I missed it. But man, so when I get the call, I had no idea. But I was the thirtieth drummer after wow. five years of recording his record, Blue Moon Swamp. Thirtieth drummer. Somebody finally recommends Kenny Erno. And uh, I was told not to even bring my drums. I'm like, really? And I got there, and he would tune the snare drum. And it was my favorite snare drum, Superphonic 400 Ludwig 5x14, which I ended up uh, creating my, let's see if I get my finger over there, right there, <laughs> my signature series snare drums. That's a 6x14. They're only making 25 of them, 40 years being with Tama. Hand engraved. It's my tattoo engraved around that that drum but anyway the first edition was a 5 by 14 and um that was a model off of his favorite snare drum the superphonic 400 ludwig but he would tune his kick drum and snare drum and have somebody tune the toms 
we we play a very simple song. We play it twice. It was just bass, guitar, and him singing, and me. Go in and listen to two takes. Let me make a few suggestions. Go out, do two more. Come back and listen. Two more. Come back. After eight takes, I went, that's pretty damn good, John. I think we got it. He went, no, nah, I think we'll we'll revisit that a little bit longer. So we do it for three and a half hours, then have a lunch break, then go to our next song. At the end of the day, he goes, Kenny, you're the drummer I've been looking for my entire life. Wow. Would you come? Yeah, exactly. Wow. And now you have to understand he's a genius. He writes the songs, writes the lyrics, arranges the songs. He is the genius behind, you know, Creedence, all those songs. He was the, the arranger, the producer, the brain behind all of it. Uh, incredible musicologist. He hears things and remembers it and then applies it. So I went, absolutely, I'll come back tomorrow. And he was very happy. He says, you know, and so I come back the next day, I go to the engineer, what are we doing today? And he's laughing. Same two songs. I went, what? What did I do wrong? He said, no, he just likes to do it. So we did the same two songs on Tuesday, three and a half hours each song. We come back the next day, and it's the same two songs. Oh, my word. <laughs> back Thursday, same two songs. I mean, you're talking about a guy who gets something in two or three takes. Finally, Friday. And it seemed like he picked the take on Friday, take 12 or 13, he said, on Friday. Probably because by then, it like we'd been on tour playing those songs, and the energy and the spirit and the vibe on Friday at, at tw take 12 or 13 was just magical. Now, I found out later, he wasn't even keeping the bass or his guitar or vocals. He was just going after drum takes. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. And so then he asked me to come back the next week, and I went, same two songs? He went, nope. <laughs> and I, I, I walked in one day, and I saw a stack of two-inch tape, like one inch, one inch wide. I went, the engineer, what is that? And he went, backbeats. I went, what? He said, not yours. No, not yours. What he would do, and this is what he did in Credence, if he'd hear a backbeat that was a little bit early, or let's say a little bit late, if it was late, he'd cut a piece out of, tape, of the tape out and stick it together with scotch tape. If it was early, he would add a little bit of tape to make it so it would land right in the right spot. He did that back in the day with Queens before anybody knew that you could cut tape. He was like creating innovative ideas to solve problems. And uh, yeah, I mean, he actually took, <laughs> back in the Queens days, he took those little tape edits, those little pieces of tape, put them in the envelope and knocked on his drummer's, um, Doug Clifford's door, it's, I think he said that in his autobiography. He says, here's your backbeats. <laughs> anyway, that's the type of how focused he was. And uh, that, could, that record won a Grammy, and then he asked me to go on tour. And I went, I'm in. To play those <laughs> songs. You see, he had not played his Creedence songs for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. And when I went on tour, we played the Creedence song. It was incredible. All the hits. Actually, you can't play all the hits in one show. No. It takes... Two shows, maybe three to play all his hits. Phenomenal stuff. Absolutely phenomenal. Love hearing anything about Credence. John's a, a legend, as you said. Um, someone else he mentioned, Smashing Pumpkins. Quickly touching on them because you joined them, I think it was, uh, it was just after the Adore uh, album was recorded, I think it was, for the, for the tour, wasn't it? Um, and I, I saw an interview with Billy Corgan that once said that... Um, he made the mistake of hiring additional percussion players. He should have just left it to you and, and backing loops from the album, that sort of thing. Now, what's your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, they were my favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite bands at that time. I was a huge fan. Uh, they were the biggest alternative band in the world, bigger than Pearl Jam, Nirvana. I mean, they were huge. And they had done Gish, Siamese Dream, and Melancholy. And yeah. then they had just recorded Door, and I was the drummer. I won an audition to do the tour, which was huge. I, you know, like those guys in, in, in the Smashing Pumpkins, I was shocked that they had two massive percussion setups to the right of me and to the left of me uh, back there. Now, Billy didn't hear all the noise because between the percussion and him was his Marshall stacks and the same with James Eha. But I heard all of it. And it was like a lot of chaos going on. And um, 
I thought, and I remember saying at one point <laughs> early in the tour, I went to that percussionist. I said, dude, can you hear what he's doing? He says, no. And I said, dude, can you hear what he's doing? No, I says, no shit. I can hear what both of you do, and it's completely <laughs> crazy. It's like two lawnmowers going at two different tempos. <laughs> they were both doing creative stuff, but it was so much stuff. Uh, you know, and it had a vibe to it, but it was very intense for me because I, my job was to hold this band down in, you know, I had click track to make sure we went, played every song in tempo. You know, check out, there's a recording, it was uh, at the Fox Theater in Atlanta, I want to say 1998, maybe August, at the Fox <laughs> Theater. It's a great really memory. Great great recording it's two hours and 15 minutes and you'll see i'm playing very i'm playing these parts but with billy he was always left room for improvising so i'm playing we have a, a structure but when we get to these certain sections um where you know i had to just it, just guess where he wanted to go so it was a combination of structure and a lot of dynamics and improvising. And it was an incredible experience for me because most of the bands I played, when you want, like Bob Seger, he wants the same cymbal crash every night, same place. I mean, Billy was like that in many ways too. He had a photographic memory and he'd want certain things right in the same place, but then he wanted you to be able to just build. And he told me, you, what you're gonna do in this band you haven't done before, which is play massive range of dynamics. And he was right. Incredible yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we're talking about live stuff. Is the the hot topic at the moment, isn't it? People talking about backing tracks and and bands that are out on the road at the moment using things that they shouldn't be. Really, they're not playing live and stuff. What's your opinion on that? Well, look, at you can do that if you want to do it. I mean, it's a lot of the sometimes people are doing it because they can't reproduce what they did yeah. in the studio. I get it, but I'll tell you this: there is no question that seeing people on stage interact and communicate humans let's start with this humans all humans are feeling creatures that's the way we're designed and we're i believe we're on this planet to experience feelings and emotions with each other that's what separates us from being a machine or a robot and to learn how to navigate through all these emotions and dynamics when a human in the audience sees other humans up there going through that, they feel like they are part of it. It's an experience. There's a torrid exchange of the emotions between the band and themselves, between the band and the audience, between the audience and the band. That's heavy. If you're playing just backing tracks and you're just standing there like robots, you're missing that whole human experience. Now the audience, that's now the argument might be the, the audience or the people in that audience say all they want to do is hear what they heard on the record cd or on the spotify or itunes they don't care they just want to hear it just the way they heard it well you can just put a backing track of the whole show and then you got actors up there just acting out the parts if people like that i can't argue with them because that's their entertainment i prefer to see people reacting and moving within around each other the dynamics or somebody is smiling going you just mess that up or you know and 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 then you you get the combination of uh, loops and like if billy had had all that percussion all the loops that were brilliant on the adora record and i played to a click track i'm king of that that would have been really cool that probably would have cleaned up because you still had all the improvising going on yeah but actually you're still stuck with what those loops do. Now, with the percussionists, what was great about them is they were reacting to everything. You know, they were all over the place, but they were reacting. So the argument would be that is cool. You see the dynamics up and down, and Billy all of a sudden does something, and I react to it, and they have to come down where I come down. And, you know, I, it, it was a lot of excitement. So, yeah, I'll, I still will go with the, the live thing. Is still my favorite. But I don't disagree with having loops and click tracks, but I don't want to take out that human element. That I don't want to lose. Absolutely. Ever. 
Absolutely. And uh, just touching on one last thing, I mean, it's an incredible thing to to leave till last. I've spoken to so many people and they all say the same thing, that their way into the music business and their love of the music business and want to be a rock star came from one special night watching the TV when four long-haired guys from Liverpool appeared in front of millions of people in America. And, yeah. um, well, you're the same. You, you, you watched that special night as well. And you got to experience what many people could only dream of when you performed at this special night, the, the night that changed America. And you got to perform on stage with Ringo and with Sir Paul and, and all the other incredible guests that came on on that night. I mean, just talk to me about how that felt playing with those guys and, and that night in general and everyone that was involved. Well, first of all, 50 years after I see the Beatles <laughs> and I ask my mom to call them up and get me in the band, which she didn't, obviously. <laughs> and I realized what my purpose in life was before I even knew what those words meant. But I knew I want to do that. And now, 50 years later, I'm playing with them, honoring for that uh, amazing night. That was extremely emotional. But like being in the Super Bowl, I had to focus on winning the game. And so I put those emotions aside and focus song by song by song. After every song, when I do a show like that, I get the script of the show. I know who has to read the teleprompter. If the teleprompter doesn't work, I mean, look at the artist, look at the stage manager, and if the producers are the same thing. So I know when to count off. I'm very highly aware of what's going on, and, uh, and, and I'm a problem solver in a situation like that. A lot of things can go wrong. Yep. So I have to be ready to adapt to make the show go right. And as a matter of fact, I walked on stage the first day of, of sound check for the show, and I heard somebody say, God, thank God he's here. I'm like, who, who, who? And he went, you. I went, oh, wow. <laughs> and what it was was the guy was going, the producer was there. It was like, geez, I know that, you know, he's seen me do Kennedy Center Honors, uh, all these big specials I did with Don was. He knows that I, I, I get the job done, you know, and I focus. And that's what I did. I just, and it was at the end that I kind of went, oh my God. And I was hanging with Paul and Ringo and they're telling us stories from Liverpool before the show, like in between rehearsal and the show. I'm hanging with Paul and Ringo talking about what it was like to be in Hamburg, you know, playing in the clubs and chords and smoking fags as they call it. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just couldn't believe it. It was me, Don was, Ben Montench from Petty's band with Ringo and Paul. and. So all this stuff, you know, and Ringo edifying me when I walked out, I walked out, I had 30 minutes left. There was 30 minutes left in the show, and I had played with Dave Grohl, you know, uh, you know, uh, John Legend and um, Alicia Keys, Joe Walsh, uh, you know, uh, Jeff Lynn from ELO, uh, John Mayer, Keith Urban, to name a few. I walk out to the audience to look for my wife, and there's Tom Hanks' his wife, Ringo Starr and his wife, Paul McCartney's girlfriend, uh, John Lennon and, and, and George Harrison's widows, then Sean Penn, uh, Tom, Johnny Depp and Tom Cruise, all there in a row. They're all acknowledging me, but Ringo's applauding and going, bravo, Kenny, bravo. I'm like, okay, this is my moment. I just played the Grammys with him the night before, right on that same stage, the Grammys. And two weeks before I done a, a thing where we honored him. I got to play double drums on four songs, which by the way, nobody plays like Ringo. <laughs> nobody, not even close. It's a unique feel and sound. Anyway, I get on my knee because everyone's looking at me in the place of like 10, 12,000 people there. I get on my knee and I'm trying to think of what I'm going to say to him. And he goes, that's okay, Kenny, I'm already married. <laughs> <laughs> I went, no, dude, you're the reason why I play drums. You're the reason why I play rock and roll music. You and the Beatles helped me realize my purpose in life, and I just want to thank you. And that was it, and I walked away. It was wow. an amazing moment. Absolutely incredible. And some of the names that you throw out are just absolutely just mind-boggling to think you've played with all these sorts of people. Is there anybody yeah. that, that you haven't played with that you, you wish you had have done or you, you really want to in future? Oh, well, I've played with, with Dave Grohl, but I mean, the be, being the Foo Fighters would would be so cool. Or Josh Holm from Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah. I think he's brilliant. Oh, I'd love to play. You know, I recorded an album with Tony I only me from Sabbath and Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple. That was a band. We did it in Wales at Mammoth Studios. I mean, that... So who else? Uh, 
I just mean, touching on that quickly, sorry to, to butt in there, I don't like to un- interrupt, but uh, Tony Iommi, working with him, I've I've spoken with a few people that have worked with him over the years, and he, he's just the master of the riff, and he gets stuff done as well. I mean, what was it like working with him? Great. It was awesome. Nicest guy in the world. Humble, sweet. Yes. I email him every so often. We keep talking about making another record. Um, he was amazing, but oh my God, his sound and his feel... It was unbelievable. And every riff. I remember Billy Corgan was producing two songs and I recorded on it with Billy in LA, Tony's first record. Billy comes in. I'd met Tony. We're hanging out. Billy comes in and goes right. To, Billy doesn't hang out. He goes right to business. He says, Tony, play me a lick. <laughs> wow. Billy goes, da, 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 and then, play me another one. <laughs> Billy goes, drums. We go out there. Next thing you know, we're making a record or a song off of those licks. It was insane. Every Each lick was like a, a movie theme or something. It's incredible. Absolutely bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. Well, Kenny, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you for this last hour or so. Uh, wonderful stories you've got to tell and even more so in your book. So just plug your book one last time for us. Well, I actually have it right back here. Uh, the book is called Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, The Hardest man, Hitting Man in Showbiz. And the book is basically about growing up in a small town of 3,000 people and not knowing, realizing what you, I want to do for my entire life, but not knowing how to begin to do that and to end up where I am. It's about hard work, self-discipline, and perseverance. Nobody's born successful, and success does not land in your lap. You have to make it happen, and that's what that story is about. Absolutely. You are a driven individual, that is for sure. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Kenny. Best of luck for everything in the future, and uh, hopefully chat with you again soon. All right, man. Take care.